Good day, everyone, and welcome to the NESG Radio. My name is Sheriff Adir Bigbe, and I am a Communications and Advocacy Associate with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Uh, today, we'll be discussing a very interesting topic, which is building high-performing team through workforce nutrition. And we have with us here today, Ms. Lovelin Agu Gabriel. Ms. Lovelin uh, she's a development practitioner and has over 13 years of experience working in the development sector. She presently works with the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center and um, she has worked in various capacities, you know, especially, you know, uh, food related matters. And at present, she's the project lead on food fortification and workforce nutrition. You are welcome, Miss Lovelin. Thank you very much. Okay, please, can you explain, you know, the correlation between, you know, adequate diet, eating well, that is proper nutrition, and um, an employee, you know, of any organization, you know, performing well. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Sharif. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss this very important um, topic that actually affects everybody, because here now, we are all workers. So when we talk about workforce nutrition, nobody is exempted especially the active population of Nigeria, which of course causes from age 25 to like 64, 65, when people get to retire, they are actively engaged in the workforce, whether um, uh, formally or the informal sector. Now, you would agree with me that it takes a healthy person in the first place to be able to work. And a healthy person is not magic. It's about what we consume. It's about the kind of food, the quality of food that um, we take in. Now, as workforce, the healthier meals they take determines how healthy they are, and how healthy they are determine how consistently productive the workforce will be because you will agree with me that if you're healthy, number of sick leaves will be reduced. Mm? And then all those accidents that happen, work-related accidents will not be there because there'll be high level of concentration. And then the morale of the worker is high. And if all of these things are in place, you would agree with me that productivity will be high. And when we say productivity high, it's not just in the products that come out, but at the end of the day, a very high return on investment because when workers are sick, they take off time to take care of themselves. That is man are true. lost. Yeah. And that is money when it comes to business. So the correlation, I don't even from a blind person's point of view, you know that when you are healthy, you're able to work better. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for that response. Mm -hmm. So um, we are looking at it also from the perspective you talked about um, there's a, a, you know, a high level of correlation between, you know, a well-nourished worker and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, their performance in the workplace. Mm -hmm. But now we are looking at going into specifics. You know, if, um, you know, an organization has a well-nourished, you know, workforce, like every employee is well-nourished, how does that translate to them? you know, performing well as a team. Yeah. Okay, so, um, for people within the work, the actively uh, production age, you know that at least one third of their day is spent within the work area. And uh, when we say one third of this day, just to bring it so that we can relate practically with it is that those eight hours you spend are the most active hours of the day. Now, whatever you eat, whatever you do around that time generally defines your health status, your nutrition status. Now, if a workforce is generally healthy, you know, all those drugs, all those excuses here and there because people want to calm down, will not be there. 
And the truth is that if people are strong, active, and their morale is high, whatever tasks you give to do would be done within the time. You know, like we say in our local palace, time now. Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> so during that time, the times you still hear, oh, I have a headache, I want to rest, oh, this. And then when somebody is not performing at the time, either of two things happen. It's either someone else takes over the, the, their own part of the job for that day. Now, when I say someone else, maybe someone on standby, which, my, which now is equal to more pay That's true. for another person going out of the employer's pocket. Or a colleague within the same line of production takes on the job of two people, which is now stressful on the other person. And stress levels, they make or mar any form of work. So when employers are adequately nourished, as a team, you see they're able to manage their stress levels better. And they're able to encourage themselves in the work. As such, more production, you know? Better productivity, generally. Actually, there's no way you can run around all these things. It's just the same circle. Just good food, good knowledge, first of all. Because if people don't understand what is good and what is bad, remember that we're all adults now. We grew up from a certain kind of background, certain kind of ethnicity that certain foods are just what is obtainable. And not just obtainable, has come to be preferable irrespective of their nutritional level or content. Hence, education is key. Because if people don't understand that this thing you love so much, you taste so nicely, does not give you the adequate nutrition that you need, that you need to add this, you need to add that, they won't even understand what to look for. They won't be able to even generate the demand for our better nutritious meals. Mm. And, and that hampers productivity even as a team because the truth is if somebody is always falling ill and you are always covering in for them it's just a matter of time you start you know because the fact that the person is ill does not mean that the person's pay will be cut and added to you so you see it's yeah. Yeah. okay thank you very much ma for that table uh, uh, at least we we now know that our audience can see that there's a direct correlation between, you know, uh, adequate nutrition, eating well, and getting the best out of your employees. Okay, so um, definitely, especially for MSMEs, you know, implementing a comprehensive workforce nutrition program, you know, in the workplace can be very daunting. Uh, it may appear easier, you know, for corporates, corporate organizations to implement workforce nutrition programs. So we are looking at it now from the perspective of what are the easy ways, you know, like easy to implement um, strategies, uh, you know, workforce nutrition strategies that um, MSMEs and um, even corporate organizations that are uh, uh, intent on, you know, uh, you know, uh, adopting workforce nutrition programs in their organizations. What are the easy strategies that they can employ? Okay, so, the first thing is for them to even understand the context of this whole workforce nutrition conversation. Because if they do not understand the context, talking about the four pillars, then whatever level at which the business is, it may be a little difficult. Now, when I say the four pillars, talking about good food, um, healthy food and snack at work, some will say any food, snack, and water <laughs> at work. Mm -hmm. Then creating like separate spaces for, you know, for eating. And then looking at or taking deliberate steps to see that even if you can't provide food for your staff because of the level of your organization, but there's certainly a means through which these workers get food around. Like 
street food vendors and all of that. So the number one step is after understanding these pillars and how they work, the challenges and all of that, number one is to make sure that this nutrition education, the awareness around it is created both for the staff and for the food vendors themselves. And then coming into some form of agreement or an understanding of the sort of combination of food that these vendors should offer. Because even in a um, construction site, once construction starts in a place, no matter how little, somehow food vendors get to know and they <laughs> mount a stand around them. So just to have a clear understanding the sort of things they should bring. And then the people who are going to be patronizing, which is the staff, to understand why eating a certain combination of food will, will work. Because that's the only way I can think of for a growing organization. Like you said, those who are already established, they understand the value of it socioeconomically, physically, mentally, and all. And of course, financially. So because of that, those ones make deliberate effort that even if they cannot provide the meals directly, they can outsource and are in control of the kind of food that come in, in control of the menu and the environment within which these foods are cooked. That's for established organizations. But for small companies, just like you mentioned, it's the only way. So it's coming into some form of understanding with food vending business owners just around the area. It's the only way. But it cannot thrive without the right education. Thank you very much. So okay. yeah, you just talked about education now, and education is always important. It's something we need to constantly do. Mm -hmm. So you work with the civil societies and Le legislative advocacy center, and yes. you obviously have done a whole lot of advocacy, you know, as regards um, workforce nutrition and all various other you know areas and in different sectors. Mm -hmm. So um, with what you have learned, you know doing advocacy in these places, you know, what are the advocacy measures that you think we should do as a people, you know, to encourage organizations, especially small and medium scale enterprises to adopt workforce nutrition? Thank you very much. Actually, whenever I think about this whole topic, that's what goes through my head. Because there is no particular framework that you will pick that talks about workforce nutrition. You know, we, we do work around food fortification. Yes, at least we have a regulation on that that sits with NAVDAN. But for workforce nutrition, you cannot pinpoint a particular legislation, legislation or regulation legislation. or policy. The only thing that has happened is that there are bits and pieces of these four components in different, different areas. areas. Now, luckily, the game, the... Um, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, they have done some form of policy analysis and have picked out certain components that exist in different you know, policy documents that speaks to these um, four pillars of workforce nutrition. Take, for example, healthy food at work. There's no, like already said, there's no particular... Um, legal framework to hold on to. However, if you look at the agricultural sector food security and nutrition strategy of 2016 to 2025, which by the way is two years to expire, that is the only way that you can see certain pointers around uh, preparing, regulation around preparing the food, you know, heating, consuming meals and all of that within the workplace and factory setting. Now, how many of us even know about that? How many Nigerians know about that? How many employers know about it? Because it's scattered everywhere. Now, if you go to the second bit that talks about nutrition, education, it's just within the national policy and strategy, and strategic plan on action on prevention of and control of non-communicable diseases. That one talks about health promotion. You can find that in 5.2 of that document. 
and dietary advice and all of that. These companies are busy. How will they start going here, pick this, going there, pick this? Will they even employ a policy analysis? Analysis, analyst, analyst, I mean, right. a policy mm -hmm. analyst who will look at all oh, this policies. to pick out, you know? And with that, you know, enforcement becomes an issue. Now, when we talk about health checks, there is no particular one except when you talk about the civil service rule and all of that that talks about compulsory health checks before the person is employed, you know, all those medical filing and, and all of that. And then the last pillar, which talks about breastfeeding support, is also in the civil service, like ILO. International uh -huh. label, uh -huh. which of course, yes. as a country within the you know, Nigeria, the label exactly. uh -huh. yeah. is there where it talks about the maternity leave, talks about breaks, break time for nursing mothers to either express or go and breastfeed. Which for other sectors, they say 30 minutes twice within okay. the day. For the mother to either go and express or breastfeed the child but that is supposed to be outside the normal work break time while for government offices two hours so one one hour inter, uh, one one hour each twice a day so you see these beats are just everywhere and getting a policy analyst who now in every organization every company to look at the various areas I talk about this, then to start enforcing it would be a challenge. So the advocacy, therefore, will be an opportunity to, you know, harmonize all of this and have it sit in one document. It has a regulation, as a policy of, of course, it will be under the Ministry of Labor okay. and Productivity. And productivity. So that this becomes clear to all these companies, and then enforcement measures will be there, and of course, deterrence for non-compliance, non and even the staff themselves, the employees themselves, will be able to have a moral justification or a legal backing okay. to be able to demand for this to be provided. So that's the area that the advocacy can be around, and that's on the one side. On the other side is, there are companies who are capable of doing this, but I'm not doing it. Probably because, one, they say where there is no law, there's no offense. Not as if there is no law as it stands. It's everywhere, but they can claim that they're not, not aware. You know, the way people can get um, So the other leg of advocacy is to, you know, reach out to these organizations and suggest to them ways and companies that are already practicing this, whether fully or, you know, partially, so that they can learn from, you know, and do the same thing. Because these are Nigerians. And statistics have shown that um, a high percentage of Nigerians are anemic. And workforce nutrition is one major way that anemia can be reduced among active population. Remember, it is within this population that people that are within the reproductive age. Ah, if a mother is anemic, the baby she will bring up. Uh, exactly, so you see the cycle, the cycle. Uh, other times people have been focusing so much on children and then grew up a bit to, you know, involve the women where they reach them through the antenatal process and all of that. But how about women who have not even reached the antenatal process yet? Who are still trying to conceive? Or who are still growing and are just starting out? Families, you know? So it is important to look in that direction and, and then for CSOs and the media. Our own is to, you know, put it out there. Put it out there. And this also comes back, putting it out there also comes back to NOA. Of course, they have to do it in partnership with their sister organization. 
because they are the mouthpiece of the government to put it out there because if people don't know they won't even be able to demand within their workspaces okay um we've heard a lot about the civil society legislative and advocacy center and um you know about all the activities that you guys engage in so um for the sake of our audience and uh, the general public that don't know much about what you do would like you to talk about it especially uh, the third party advocacy that involves the civil society legislative advocacy center CISLAC, uh el africa and the nigerian economic summit group okay thank you very much okay so CISLAC, like most people know it is the acronym for Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center. Now, CISLAC is a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization. And we work around information sharing, policy and legislative advocacy, capacity building, especially for state actors and, and civil society. Now, for state actors, so that they understand, because they know these things to bring to their mind again and again and again the consequences of specific issues that we talk about and also ways they can make things better and then to civil society because since slack alone cannot go so far you know the idea if you want to go fast go alone but if you want to go far so that we have you know a lot of people engage you know multiplicity of you know voices on the issue particularly for collective impact now CISLAC is also the chapter national chapter for transparency international in nigeria the platform through which the cpi is usually um released every year where they rank which country is most corrupt among the 180 countries that are usually surveyed. And CISLAC as an organization works programmatically in five different areas. And then we always say that we have six areas of our work, but the sixth one is institutional strengthening so that we're strong enough to be able to do all that we do. So the first area of our work has to do with support to democratic governance, where we do everything we do around elections, good governance, and all. Then the second one, which is more like our mainstay, is public finance management. That is anti-corruption work generally. So even though most of what we do is accountability, but we have a central point for all our anti-corruption related work. Then the third area of our work has to do with security and IDP issues. While the fourth has to do with environment and conservation of nature. Now the fifth programmatic area has to do with health, human capital development and social inclusion, which is under the area of the work that anything health falls under, which is where the third party advocacy campaign comes in. Now, over the years, we've done a lot of work in all these areas. I don't know if I want to start boring you with all of that. Uh, but you can see our footprint in areas like the NAITI Act, FOI Act, where part of the people pushed the National Tobacco Control Act, and gender bill, and all those things. CISLAC participated actively in that, contributed to all that work. Even the Open Government Partnership is something that CISLAC does very well. And CISLAC has been part of the National Steering Committee for OGP for since it started, till now that we've moved on to the um, National Working Committee okay. on that. Now, focusing on the third party advocacy uh, work, Okay, so before I get down to that, within the health space, we contributed to pushing for the implementation of the National Health Act and having um, the primary health care development agencies in states like Kasina, Kaduna, Kanu, and all of that, Jigawa. So I'm saying contributing because there's no one organization. 
it all. They, they could have done all on their own. And then we've also had a lot of programming around nutrition, where we had engagement across 11 northern states. Child and family health is something we've done for long, and of course we cannot take out nutrition from that whole gamut of work. And most recently, we worked before the church party advocacy, we worked around um, severe acute malnutrition uh, advocacy, where we're advocating for funding for the CMAM, that is community management of acute malnutrition and all of that, which the third party advocacy work is more like building on. Now, when you talk about nutrition generally, people just think about people who are looking, looking uh, malnourished. malnourished. No, However, there is something that is bedeviling virtually everybody, which is micronutrient deficiency. And that is what is now called hidden hunger. So initially, when you talk about malnutrition, people just think about the kwashoko. But now somebody can look big and it's malnourished, which is why it is called hidden hunger. You have to look and look again to understand that. And it is this channel that the third party advocacy is focusing on to deal with issues of hidden hunger and, of course, the physical hunger. Because the physical hunger is easy. You would think just eat, 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 and you're good. But how about the hidden hunger, which is where food fortification is very, very important. All right. Which is the thing that the third party advocacy is focusing Focus on. Them. Yes. Uh, okay, so, and for the, to deal with this food fortification thing, so I mentioned earlier that there's a regulation. Now, the whole work around the third party advocacy is that food producers comply with the provisions of the regulations about the food vehicles that should be fortified. Now, when we say food vehicles, people will be wondering, our vehicle that we drive? No. There are certain staple foods that in every home you go to, you will see. Rice, oil, sugar, sugar salt, salt flour, flour, and all. Every day, I ate bread this morning, and I'm sure. A whole lot of, a whole lot of food. <laughs> so, that's a, so it is saying that if this selected food vehicles, which were not just uh, selected from the top of um, government head, but true research that shows that everybody consumes this, that if these items are fortified, then people, Nigerians, will be eating healthier food and will look healthier. So that is what the third party advocacy tends to push. But of course, when we say food producers comply, of course, there's a part for the government. They are the ones who enforce. They are the ones who monitor. They are the ones who certify so that they to do what they need to do. And of course, getting other people on board, other CSOs and media to loud it. Praise the, the companies that are already doing it Encourage those who are not already doing it to do more. And then by praising organizations or food products that are already fortified, Nigerians understand and are able to make better choices when they go to get things, when they go to get items for consumption. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Lovely. Uh, so uh, today uh, you heard it all from um, Ms. Lovely Abu Gabriel. You know, she's talked about the importance of um, workforce nutrition in the work workspace, and um, our workforce nutrition in the workplace can help reduce malnutrition amongst the active population. That's uh, people between the ages of 15 to 65 years. Uh, reduce malnutrition, not just in the active population, but also amongst people, uh, pregnant women. You know, reduce uh, anemia in pregnant women. Reduce. Uh, malnutrition and stunted growth in young children. Thank you very much uh, for being a part of today's program. We really appreciate your presence. You. So to our audience, we also thank you for listening to today's interesting program. We hope um, you'd um, you know, continue to listen to us and also help us in this advocacy around um, workforce nutrition. 
To listen to other interesting programs, please visit um, www.nesgroup.org if you want to learn more about workforce nutrition and um, to also engage and listen in other, to other interesting um, episodes of this uh, interesting podcast, uh, visit www.nesgroup.org forward slash podcast. Thank you and see you once again.